Um, so uh, we had some Lusitania, huh? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Okay, well, good. Let's see here. Submarine. Mm -hmm. Had we done the Battle of Jutland? Yeah. We're... Sea Battle of yeah. Jutland. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, and had we talked anything about the preparedness movement? Yeah. Fair okay. We did the preparedness movement. Yeah. You know what that is? Yeah. And had we done the election of 1916 where Wilson is reelected? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. What's what do you have after Wilson being reelected? Jeremy said we will start to sink ships without warning. Thank you. And that's it. That's the last thing you have. Thank you. This is a lecture for my third hour class on 331. All right. So Woodrow Wilson is reelected. Uh barely. Barely reelected. He uh, Wilson was never. He didn't have the popularity of a Teddy Roosevelt. Wilson was just sort of looked at someone. We're going to hire this guy because he can do the job. But we don't necessarily like him. But he won, uh, and uh, he was sworn in in March of 1917. In February of 1917, got this down. Have we talked about the German plan? To, well, I'll just say it again. Have we talked about that? We'll stay in. We'll start submarine warfare, and yeah. the Americans will come into the war. But before they can get over here, right, like we'll have won. We year. right, yeah. and it came that close. Germany almost won this war. It, they came that close to winning the war. Um, and again, we're not talking about the Hitler Nazi Germans. We're talking about, uh, and if they'd won the war, you say, well, what would have been different about the world today? I would say not much. If Hitler had won the war, won the war, you wouldn't recognize. I mean, the world you're in today wouldn't exist. I'll just put it to you that way. So anyway, um, the Germans start submarine warfare uh, again, unrestricted. That they, they've been sinking ships, but they had been warning that this is sinking ships without warning. And when they did that, let this down. Wilson, have we talked about breaking diplomatic relations? That's where we are. Okay. Okay. So we did that. Bring our ambassador back from Berlin and send theirs back. That happens all the time today. And it's no big deal. But I don't know if we've kicked the Russian ambassador out or not, but it's no big deal. But in those days, it was a serious, serious matter. And it was the last step. It was the last step unto war. Uh, and so, uh, you know, things are pretty tense. And in February of 1917, get this down, February of 1917, we haven't done the Zimmerman note, have we? Mm -hmm. the, the British handed, in the White House, the British handed Wilson a message that they had intercepted, a top secret message that they had intercepted. And by the way, they had had it for a while, but they were waiting for just the right moment. So now we've broken diplomatic relationship the relations, it looks like we're on the edge of war, and they hand Wilson that. There's the message undecoded. That's how the British intercepted it, <clears throat> and there is the message decoded, and I'll read it to you in just a moment. This message, get this down, was sent to, from the German government, to the Mexican government. Got that down. From the German government to the Mexican government. And I believe the German ambassador in Mexico City was a man named Arthur Zimmerman. And so this is called, but, but get this in your head, it's coming from Germany to Mexico. Uh, it is called the Zimmerman note or the Zimmerman telegram. The Zimmerman note or the Zimmerman telegram. And here's what it said. Uh, some of us I can't make out, but anyway, 
This is the Germans talking to Mexico. We, Germany, intends to begin on the 1st of February unrestricted submarine warfare. We shall endeavor, in spite of this, to keep the United States of America out of the war neutral. In the event that this is not successful, we make Mexico the following proposal of an alliance on the following basis. Make war together, make peace together. Generous financial support and an understanding on our part, on the part of Germany, that Mexico is to reconquer the lost territory in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. The settlement in detail is left up to you. You will inform the president of Mexico of the above most secretly as soon as the United States declares war against Germany. And add the suggestion that the president of Mexico on his own initiative should invite Japan to declare war on the United States. Uh, please call the president's attention to the fact that the ruthless employment of our submarines now offers the prospect of compelling England in a few months to make peace, uh, signed Arthur Zimmerman. So it is the Zimmerman note. Here, get this down, is what, I want you to know what the Zimmerman note uh, called for. Here it is. Germany said to Mexico, if the United States declares war on Germany over the sinking, the, uh, the uh, uh, unrestricted submarine warfare, we want Mexico to declare war on the United States. By the way, how were Mexican-American relations in 1917? Bad. What had we just done? And what had they had done? They had invaded, you know, Pancho Villa, and then we, you know, we had, we had troops down there. Hey, there were people in 1916, not many, but there were people in 1916 in Washington, in the government, talking about declaring war against Mexico. You know, relations aren't good. And so what, what Germany is saying, if the United States declares we want Mexico, with the help of Japan, if you can persuade them to, to uh, invade the United States and tie down the U U.S. Army on the Mexican border so the U.S. Army can't be sent here to Europe until we win the war. And if you do that, if you win, and we win the war, and we will win the war if you do that, you get back everything. <clears throat> Mexico gets back everything that they lost in the Mexican War from 1846 to 1848, two little two year called the Mexican War. You see that? The United States took all that from Mexico. It's called the Mexican Session, it was the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. 60 years before World War I. Were you with me? 60 years before World War I. Look, Mexico ran all the way. It was one of the largest countries in the world. It ran all the, Mexico. They had conquered all of this. Uh, they uh, ran all the way from Col northern Colombia up to Oregon and Washington State. This was Mexico. 1846 to 1848, the United States fights this war. They take this. It's called the Mexican Session. What is today? California, Arizona, New Mexico, half of Texas. Uh, Colorado, um, and Nevada, uh, and uh, parts of Montana, even parts of Montana, uh, Idaho, uh, and Wyoming, we're all part of that. And what they're saying is you lost that 60 years ago to the United States, you help us, we'll win the war and you get it back. And that's the message they handed to Wilson in the White House. And when Wilson got that message, he crumpled it up like this, and he said to the British ambassador, this means war. This means war. Well, go to March of 19, so that's in, that's in February, the next month. Go to March of 1917, and in the month of March, get all this down, in the month of March, the Germans sunk four American merchant ships. Not four warships, but four merchant ships. And I want you to write this date down. This is a date I want you to remember on April 3rd, April 3rd, 1917, Woodrow Wilson became the first American president to appear before the Congress and ask them to declare war. Only two had. You know, Lincoln didn't ask the, didn't go over and ask the Congress to declare war in 1860. James K. Polk in 1846. Uh, James Madison in 1812. No, they didn't do that. But Wilson goes over. Per, you know, James K. Polk when he wanted to go to war against Mexico, he just sent his message over and the clerk read it. But Wilson, the school teacher, he wants to appear in person. So there he is. 
in front of the Congress of the United States. First time that ever happened. It's only happened twice. 25 years later, Franklin Roosevelt, the day after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, he'll stand in the same spot and he will deliver that speech. I've stood in that spot where the president gives the State of the Union message. I was in a, I'm a political science minor and when I was in school, we took a trip up to do research. Our class did in Washington and stayed there. One of Oklahoma congressman named Wes Watkins, he met us in the Capitol one night to just give us a personal tour when all the crowds weren't there. And we went into the house and he was just said, would you all like to stand up here? And so we said, no pictures, but we all stood up one at a time behind where the president gives the State of the Union message. And where Wilson was asking, where Wilson was asking for war. Um, anyway, uh, Wilson went over and gave his war message. Now, get this down. When a president asks for war, he doesn't just go over and say, gee, boys, I want war. Thank you very much. And leave. He's got to tell them why. And so okay, I want you to give, I want you to write down the reasons that Wilson asked for war. Number one, he said, if you ever see this phrase in any of your future academic studies, uh, always related to Woodrow Wilson in World War I. He said, number one, uh, wait a minute. Uh, to end all war. He actually believed that by fighting in this war, the United States and the Allies would win and there would never be another war. So he said, no, I want this to be the war that ends all war. The war to end all war. By the way, something I haven't told you that just flittered across my mind, write this down. World War I, when it was fought, was not called World War I. Get this down. It was called the Great War. If you ever hear the Great War, the Great War is World War I. When did World War I become, when did the Great War become World War I? World War II. World War II. And then you have World War I, World War II. But up until this, this is simply called, the men who fought in it called it the Great War. Okay? The Great War. So we're going to fight to end all war. And number two, we're going to fight to make the world safe. We're going to make the world safe for democracy. You with me? <clears throat> to make the world safe for democracy. Is that still true? Do we fight wars to spread democracy? Can you give me our latest example of a war to spread democracy? Afghanistan, Afghanistan Iraq, Vietnam. We're going to make it into a democracy. How's that working out for us? Not good. No, no, absolutely horrible. Not good, because you know what? Rarely is it successful when a country, an outside country imposes, I don't care what the government is, imposes a government on a nation. Where did our government come from? Did somebody impose that constitution, write it and say, all right, America, here's your kind of United States, here's your, no, 55 Americans met in a room, 55 elected Americans met in a room and they wrote it. And it's been one of the most successful documents and governments in the history of the world. You know why it's been so, it's self-correcting. You can, you can correct the mistakes. They made sure. And it's one of the most successful governments uh, and democracies uh, in, in the world. Okay? I know people that think living here in the United States, there are problems. We've always had problems. We always have to deal with problems and try to make things better. But there are people living in this country, and they think they are just oppressed. This is the worst. You know, go try Iran. Go try Korea. Go try, go, go try China. Or, or, you know, uh, go try England. You know, England's a wonderful, wonderful country. It's a great democracy, but they've got a class structure over there. And you talk to an Englishman, and they'll tell you that. They've got a class structure, you know, still to this very day. They're trying to, they've been trying to get rid of it for about 100 years, but they haven't gotten rid of it yet. Yeah. I mean, go try some of these places. You know, people, when people, when people, and there's nothing wrong with criticizing the United States when something's wrong. That, that's how we get better. Nobody in, in the world is opposed to that. When people, you know, come to me and say, oh, I'm just, you know, this is, I'm just so proud, this is the Lord, you know, I say, well, you know, find you a better country. You know, we don't restrict travel. You, you know, if you lived in China, your travel would be restricted. If you wanted to come to the United States and study, you'd have to apply for years and years and years. That's just unheard of. To Americans, we go where we want to go. So you can do it. Just pick you out one and go there. And you might be happy and live happily ever after. Power to you. But that constitution has provided more freedom for more people than any government in the history of the world. None other can match it. But anyway, back to what I was saying, but we are still in the business of trying to make the world safe for democracy. Uh, and so our foreign policy, write this down, we have, you know, we, we send young people that look like you to die in these places. 
to make them a democracy. <clears throat> we have, and Woodrow Wilson is one of my least favorite presidents, him and Thomas Jefferson. I can't stand either one of them. But, uh, well, you know, we have a Wilsonian, for, and this is one of the reasons why, we have a Wilsonian foreign policy. People, some people think, and we have, you know, if you, if you don't, if you think Wilson's dead, if you think his fingers are all over U.S. foreign policy today. In fact, you can't understand U.S. foreign policy today unless you understand that. But by the way, Wilson didn't come up with this whole thing. All this is is a replay of a movement, and we've talked about it, that arose in this country in the 1840s. What's that called? To spread our culture and our values. Manifest destiny. Yeah, okay. Wilson is just a replay of manifest destiny, going back all the way to the 1840s. By the way, is Vladimir Putin practicing manifest destiny? What's he trying to do? Force his culture on the Ukraine. That's exactly right. He's not doing too well, but that's exactly what he's trying to do. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, to make the world safe for democracy. Uh, and then Wilson, after he gave his war message, he went back to the uh, White House uh, and he laid his head on a, ta a table in the cabinet room and he wept, okay? He wept so hard that people who were there said his shoulders were heaving, okay? Well, then, get this down. So he sent his war message. He's asked the Congress for war. Now a tremendous debate broke out in the Congress because, get all this down, the country was divided, as you know. The country was divided. In fact, while well, look, while he's standing there, while that picture's being taken, those congressmen sitting there could hear out on the steps of the Capitol, there were 2,000 war protesters, that's what we would call them today, chanting, no war. Now, they could hear that coming from the outside. The isolationists got this down. So, so the country's divided. I want to get that down quickly. The, the country's divided going to war. A lot of people don't want to go. Uh, and that's bad. You know, uh, you want the country as united as it can possibly be, and Wilson is going to lead a divided country to war. The isolationists there say, don't get involved in a European war. Uh, there are a lot of Irish Americans that are there. Uh, and these Irish Americans, you know, uh, England had owned their country for 400 years. Uh, they had constantly tried to revolt and throw the British out, and the British would come over and crush them and hang I Irishmen all over, uh, all over the place. Uh, the Irish were saying, we're not going to go, we don't want to go fight for the British. Uh, there was a large German segment in this country. There were pacifists, there were progressives who said, if we go to war, all this money we could use to make society better will be spent to make weapons to kill our fellow humans. So the country, the country is divided. And there's no better example of that. There's a close-up of Wilson giving his speech. There's no better example of that than uh, this woman. Write her down, Jeanette Rankin. Jeanette Rankin was a Republican from Montana. And she was the only woman in the Congress. She was a pacifist. Pacifists are opposed to violence, including war. And the very first vote, you know, not only is she the first woman, that's a big deal, but her very first vote when she comes to the Congress, her very first vote was on the war, whether or not that uh, she would go to war. Well, she voted, get this down, she voted against the war. I want you to just know there was that rank in a past, and I want you to know why are we talking about it. She voted against the war. And, that, and, and people ask her, that's the very first vote she ever cast, and people ask her, why did you vote against the war? And she said, I am a woman, and I can't go fight. And she said, I just can't in good conscience vote to send someone else to fight. So she voted against that. And this time, get this down, 50 members of Congress joined her. 50 members. They, 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 listen, they debated this war bill all day long. And they didn't, they didn't vote for war until midnight. They didn't vote for war until midnight. So over 50 members of Congress, and that's a big deal, over 50 members of Congress voted against this war. And she was one of them. She was still sitting in that seat in the House of Representatives representing Montana 25 years later when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And on December 8th, Franklin Roosevelt came down and he gave his war speech 25 years after Wilson. And uh, 
the Congress voted war in 30 minutes. Uh, there was only one vote against the war in World War II. Who cast that vote? Right. Jeanette Rankin. She was the only one to vote against it. And that time, the people of Montana voted her out of office, and so she was no longer in the House of Representatives, okay? So Jeanette Rankin votes against World War II. By the way, what was the hard vote to cast that day? Was it harder to vote for the war or against the war? For yeah, everybody's voting for it. Jeanette Rankin, she votes against it. That took real courage. And by the way, to finish her off, after she's kicked out of Congress or by the voters of Montana, she did. She she continued to protest war. I mean, she's 88 years old. In 1968, the Vietnam War is going on, and she actually led a war protest against the Vietnam War. It's fine to disagree with Jeanette Rankin. I would have disagreed. I might have voted with her in World War I. Uh, I would have disagreed with her in World War II, uh, I think that was a war that had to be fought. But still, I respect her for the courage, for standing by the courage of her convictions. And so uh, the nation went to war. Well, as soon as the war, get this, as soon as the war was declared, as soon as the war was declared, the government, I guess what I'm going to say, the government took over the American economy. If you ran a grocery store, the government told you how much a gallon of milk would sell for or a loaf of bread. They took over the entire economy. The government took over and ran the railroads. Get all this down. The government's going to take over. Everything's going to go now to win the war. Individualism is out. If you were a landlord and you were renting apartments, they told you what the rent was going to be. And by the way, get this down. The rent won't go up as long as we're in war for a year. Rent was stabilized. You can't charge any more than this. And by the way, if you're working, you're not going to get a raise as long as we're at war. Uh, since the workers won't get a raise, prices of groceries can't go up. Since the workers won't get a raise, uh, while the war's going on, their rent can't go up. They took over every aspect. They instituted a thing that we just went to here, daylight savings time. Daylight savings time Went uh, goes to World War One. What's the purpose of daylight saving? Why do we change the clocks? By the way, they're debating in the Congress whether or not to do away with daylight savings time. There's some states that don't do it. Indiana, I think, they keep their clock the same all year. <clears throat> what? Why did they institute daylight savings time? What, what's it, huh? No. Why did they institute daylight savings time? <clears throat> What? No, no, did you say the railroads? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not the railroads. An educated guess, but that's not it. What advantage is there for the days being longer? You know, right now. Oh, it's war, longer days. For what? War. Well, you can work in the dark. You have to work in the dark. No. But it has to do the war. You save electricity. You save electricity. You know what generates electricity? You, want? you say, yeah, you save electricity. The longer the days, okay? The longer the days. Um, the, long, the longer the days go on, the less electricity you use. And it was important to save electricity. Uh, that's why they did it. And it starts in World War I. Uh, also, get, you know, and, and just to show you that they have their hands in everything, not just daylight savings time, uh, they actually, get this down, the act, government actually um, controlled how many stops an elevator could make in a building. I mean, they left no stone unturned. Um, for example, if you worked on the 10th, you know, here you are and you worked on the 10th floor here, your elevator might stop on the 5th and you had to go up to the five stories. Or if you worked on the 15th, you had to go down. It didn't stop. Out on every, it didn't stop on every floor to say electricity. I mean, just imagine, you know, the government suggested, they just suggested that we wear a mask. And I thought people were going to jump off the top of the gym. Oh my God, you're taking away my freedom. Oh, 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 you know, imagine that. The government controlled everything here. And by the way, unlike today, they didn't ask people. They didn't say, oh, gee, would you like to keep your prices the same in your grocery store? They said, this is what your prices would be. And by the way, get this now, I'm talking about farmers. They told farmers what they were going to plant. They told farmers, this is what you're going to plant. You don't have any question about it. Okay. 
write this man down, Herbert Hoover. And then there was a big effort to say food, okay? Uh, and this man, oh, by the way, uh, I left something very important out here. That, write down the War Industries Board. The War Industries Board. That's all those things I just talked about, railroads, elevators, daylight savings, time all, rent prices, they ran it. And uh, they were headed by a man named Bernard Baruch. Bernard Baruch. Okay, so he's the head of the War Industries Board. And they're deciding everything. <clears throat> also, got this down. Uh, the chief food administrator. Food's going to be rationed in this country. You don't get to go to the store and buy the chief food administrator. You don't get to go to the store and buy whatever you want. The chief food administrator. Uh, and his thing was, save food. The more food we save, the more food there is for the Army. And he instituted a thing called Wheatless Mondays. What was that all about? Don't do what on Monday? Wheat, eat bread. Write that down. Somebody said this morning, eat wheat. Gee, what do we have? Something? Here's a bucket of wheat. No, bread. The more bread you don't eat, the more there is for the troops. And also, meatless Tuesdays. Wheatless Mondays and meatless Tuesdays. Okay? Meatless Tuesdays. To save food. And of course, get this down. There's a reason for all this. It's not just about saving bread. You know, today we have a professional. What, what percentage of the. Everybody get up. Get up. Stand up. Now sit down. Oh, you look like you've been beat with a stick. Anyway. Jesus. Anyway. <clears throat> this is not just about saving bread and meat. Look. What percentage of the American people serve in the armed forces and protect us from all these bad guys today? There are 330 million of us. So it's a real simple question. What percentage of them, how many of them are, are in the military? How many are out there? They're, and by the way, you're, just in case you don't know this, John Wayne, you're protected every day, every second of your life. There are brave young Americans protecting you, tough guys. So how many do you think there are? What percentage of us? Huh? 5%. 5%? It's like 50. 50%. Yeah, that's more like it. 75%. 75 percent. 75% 75 of the 330 million people in the United States are in the military. They're in the Army and the Navy and the Marines. Huh? Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> Five or two. Point five percent, not even one percent. And what are the rest of us doing in this big, dumb, happy country? Well, we're sitting in the middle of the morning all bleary-eyed like we're about to collapse. Yeah. What we're doing, we're going to the prom. Well, I'm just trying to look at Chris's prom now. You can criticize Constitution, but prom, that's pretty funny. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's about as far as our little B brains go. And we're not going, are we? No, <laughs> you're not thinking about going. You're not going to put on a uniform and go anywhere. You're just going to suck the good out of this country for the rest of your life. And it's not going to cost you a thing. It's going to cost somebody else something. That less than 1%. And that's the way we do things today. We were in Afghanistan for 20 years. I'll bet you I could call a school assembly and say, and we fought a war in the last 20 years, and they just uh, don't even realize it. So you know what Wilson was trying to do here? All that's true, by the way. Well, that offends me. Good. I hope I offend you. You hear that out there in TV land? I hope I offend them. Maybe it'll spark their little brains to start punching. What Wilson was trying to do, very different from today, in other words, he said, we're not just going to leave war to the soldiers. We want the whole country to be involved. We want the whole country. So if you're running a business and you've got to sacrifice a little bit, if you're on the job working and you don't get a pay raise, well, guess what, big boy? That's your sacrifice of the war. He wants the whole country to come along. And it's even more so in World War II. More so in World War II. I see these, when the government suggested that people wear a mask. Oh, my constitutional liberty is my freedom. I'm going to jump off a bridge. You know what they told you in World War II? You know what they told you? They didn't say, would you like to? You know what they told you? 
They said, you're going to get one gallon of gas a week, Jethro. I can imagine the reaction today. Anyway, some of these people that haven't thought in their whole life beyond their own concerns, what I want. They have no interest in this country. It's amazing. Just me. Me, me, this, me, 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 me. Yeah. Well, Wilson said, I want the whole country to come along. And that's why they did this. And to an extent, it worked. To an extent, it worked. In other words, he wanted everybody. You know, we're, not just, we're not just going to send an army to Europe like we send an army to Africa. Everybody's going to have some skin in the game. Let me show you why I'll never be elected to anything. I said in the middle of this Afghani war, they ought to raise the, uh, they ought to put a 50 cent a gallon tax on gas. Oh my God, that made you twitch. You know, I could burn the con that copy of the Constitution. So we just sit there, uh, you know, and say the price of gas. Oh, well, that's important. Idiots. It's as far as some people's brain go, what a gallon of gas costs them. How pathetic. But I think they ought to. So all of us can feel just a little, not much, just a little bit of pain and sacrifice that those guys and gals over in the Khyber Pass of Afghanistan for 20 years were feeling. Yeah. How do you think that'd go over? You think you'll ever hear a president saying we're going to raise, put 50 cent a gallon of gas in tax on? You think you'll hear that? No. No, they're scared too. They know who they're dealing with. They know who they're a bunch of spoiled, narcissistic idiots, as they say in Ireland. Anyway, yeah. Well, Wilson said we're going to bring the whole country along, and that's why he did this. And also get this down. The war. How did they finance the war? Huh? Well, they might have been. No, no, no. Taxes. We, we were in Afghanistan for 20 years. How did we finance that war? And we spent trillions. <laughs> we spent trillions and lost. How did we finance it? Did they tax us? Yeah. Did the president get up and say, we're at war, we're going to have to raise your taxes? Absolutely not. So how did we finance it? We borrowed it. Trillions added to the national debt. We borrowed it. That's the way we work. Because they're not going to ask us to sacrifice anything. We're the American people. We just want everything. We don't want to sacrifice anything. Yeah. Yeah. When World War I, get this down, they mainly did it through bonds. Bonds. Do you know anything about savings bonds? Have you ever heard of that? Have you ever heard of that? Do you know how it works? Do you have any bonds? I don't either. I used to have some, but I don't. Saving bonds work like this. You go down to the bank and you fall over, or RMS Bank, or Merchants Bank, Farmers Bank. And you say, I want to buy a savings bond. And I want to buy a $50 savings bond. You give them 50 bucks. They don't keep that money. You, as a citizen, are loaning that money to your government. It goes directly to the federal government. And there's a maturity date on it. You can say, well, I don't want to you know, buy this bond for five years or 10 years. Let's just say five years. So they give you the bond. And you take it home and put it in your safety deposit box. And five years from now, you say, my bond is matured. And you take it back. And you say, I want to cash this bond in. And they say, yes. And the government will pay you your $50 back plus what? More interest. Huh? Interest. interest. That's exactly right. So, you know, I mean, bonds used to be a pretty good investment. I don't know what the rate is today. I mean, it's pretty low. But let's just say you... Loan the government fifty dollars for ten years; they might give you back sixty-five. Okay, absolutely. But anyway, the point is, is not how much you make in interest. It's the fact that the citizen is loaning his government money, and that's the way they finance both World War One and World War Two. Now, in World War Two, it was a much more massive undertaking, and there was some taxation. But both World War One and World War Two, that's the way. That's the way they did it. Write that down. Bonds, and they had huge bond drives. Movie stars, great athletes. Do you think if Tom Brady said, I'm going to be at the, you follow high school next Monday to sell bonds, you think a few thousand people would show up to see him? I do. They'd come from all over this part of the country, maybe. Movie stars, great athletes would go out and sell bonds and they would stand up and give a big speech and they'd say, I just, I'm going to buy $5,000 worth of bonds. I want you to buy bonds. And people would buy bonds, maybe a $50 bond. 
You went to the movies and you came out, there was a table in the lobby, people selling bonds. When you went to the post office over the side, there was a people on the a table uh, selling bonds. When you went to church on Sunday, people were selling bonds, okay? It was a way to get the citizens involved and pay for the war, uh, and it worked pretty successfully. That's the main way in which the war was, uh, the war was uh, uh, financed, okay? We'll write this down as well. Civil liberties. <laughs> Civil liberties. <clears throat> so talking about the war. When, you know, you're seeing how America changed rapidly once we go to war. And I want you to write this down. Uh, Civil liberties suffered. In this country. Now, first thing, before you understand that, what are civil liberties? What are your civil liberties? Can you name me one of your civil liberties? Speech. speech. That's one. That's a big one. Expression. What? Expression. Religion. Religion. Anything else? You got arrested. Do you get a jury trial? Yeah. If you can't afford a lawyer, are you given a lawyer? Mm -hmm. State will provide one. Yeah. All those are your civil liberties. The right to bear arms is your civil liberty. You can have a can out in the garage. Just for squirrel. <laughs> Some people think that. But they haven't read the Second People quote the Second Amendment all the time and they leave out one. And I'm going to get I'm not going to get into a discussion about the Second Amendment. The people say the Second Amendment says I can own any gun I want. That's just so wrong. They leave one word out in the Second Amendment. Read it closely. And they always they do say, What's the second the right to bear arms? You better read that again, yeah, Jeff Rowe. Anyway, but those are all your civil liberties. And so what do I mean by when I say during World War I, civil liberties suffered? You didn't have any of those freedoms. What? You didn't have any of those freedoms. You, uh, did you say you didn't have any of those freedoms. Well, you have, but they were, get this down. You're right. Get this down. A lot of civil liberties were restricted by the government. A lot of civil liberties were restricted by the government. In other words, get this down. Before the war, we debated. There were people for it and there were people against it. We debated the war. But once the war starts, the attitude of the government is the debate is over. Get this down. You should, if you're a real American, if you're a real American, you will support the war. And if you don't support the war, what does that mean? Yeah, and more than that, you're not an American, and you just may be what? A traitor. A traitor. Working for who? The Germans. The Germans. You may be a spy. And just know this. Little man, we're going to find out where you are, and we're going to put you in jail, or we're going to deport you. You like Germany? Go there. Does that sound like the America you live in? You stand up and say the war in Afghanistan is wrong? Yeah, we're not going to jail? Huh? We're going to Afghanistan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you were get this out, if you were there were people that were communists, members of the Communist Party. You're you're in trouble. There were people who were socialists. You're in trouble. If you were a pacifist, you're in trouble. Huh? Pacifist. If you're a pacifist, you're in trouble. Or if you are a conscientious objector, write this down. Conscientious. Objector. A conscientious objector is someone who says when they are called to military service, they say, my conscience keeps me from fighting. I can't do it. And there's some people who are sincerely, uh, or who are Quakers throughout history. Their religion teaches them not to, although some Quakers have fought. <clears throat> have you seen the movie Hacksaw Ridge? Okay, that young man was a conscientious objector. I don't know. Just a second. I need to see Whitney Cass and Jake Berry in the office. Was he a, a Quaker in the movie? Okay, and of course, but he said, I, I can't fight, but I want to go and serve my country. He did, and at the Battle of Okinawa, saved many, many lives. 
So some of them are sincere, but if in World War One, once the war gets started, you say I'm a conscientious objector, what do people say? You're not you're just using that as an excuse, really. You're a what? You're a traitor and a coward. You're a traitor and a coward. If you're in a minority group, get this down. If you're an African American, if you're a Roman Catholic. If you're not part of the majority, you just write it down like this. If you're not part of the majority, you can be in real trouble in World War I. And we will talk further about that after your test tomorrow. If you're late, tell them that I held you over. If they need a phone call or a note, just uh, let me know. If you need a note right now, let me know. Well, you know, um, uh, yeah, I thought I I, uh, I watched about the last one.